how people get to have diabetes or how so many New Zealanders now have type 2 diabetes is not an individual problem. Unhealthy diets and obesity are now our biggest risk for disease in this country and they're just driving obesity upwards and that is going to be our biggest health problem now and into the future. There is no way that people in this environment are going to be able to sustain long-term weight loss while they live in this world which is awash with energy-dense food. We know what needs to happen in terms of changing the environment. It's how to change it in a way that is cost-effective, politically acceptable, socially acceptable, culturally acceptable, and gets the buy-in of society as a whole, turns out to be bloody difficult. We are in the middle of a type 2 diabetes epidemic, a disease that barely existed 40 years ago, and it's only going to get worse. In 20 years, it's predicted half a million New Zealanders will have it. Experts tell us it's not about willpower, so what are the solutions? Brian Kaido feels solutions are too late for him. I've got type 2 diabetes, and I've had it since the year 2000. And you get lots of bugs when you're on dialysis. And so I had a bug in my blood, and that bug had settled into disinfection in my hip. And um, as a consequence, I couldn't walk anymore. They sort of got that all under control and it started coming right and they said, but unfortunately, and they looked at one of my toes and um, they said, that toe needs to go. They say that once the surgeons start, begin to chop, it's pretty hard for them to stop after that. Back on the ward. So now I'm desperately trying to keep it under control and trying to hang on to these little tiny limbs I have left. Not on the winning side of that battle, I'm afraid. One post-amputated foot. Just gotta hope that this all heals up nicely and then I can keep my foot. We've got aquasol in there as well. Aquasol, oh yeah, aquasol dressing. Okay. There it is. Unfortunately, this is one of the things that can happen. You can have very slowly start getting amputations and I've got um, all these things showing up on my hands. And if they can't find out what's causing that, and they start to swell and get infected, then they'll start losing fingers as well. If they can't bring any of this infection in control and it continues to start wasting my limbs, they have no option but to remove my legs. I, I reckon the reason why there's such an epidemic of diabetes, type 2 in particular now, when I was a child, we didn't have access to as many fast foods as we have access to now. You know, I'm, I'm guilty of it. I brought up my kids on McDonald's and fish and chips and Georgia pie, and um, it's the economic um, accessibility of it for me. And they do tend to stay in the, um, quite a lot of them, more in the lower socioeconomic areas because they, they know you know, keep your food range nice and cheap and we'll buy it. It's been a month since Brian had his left leg amputated. It's still hard for him to look at. Unfortunately, the infection caused by type 2 diabetes has come back. Now he may need to lose the entire leg. There it is. Hopefully the antibiotics are getting rid of the infected tissue and I get to keep this. 
<laughs> trying to hang on to this now. <sighs> I didn't want this to happen in the first place. I didn't come into hospital to have anything taken off my body. And now I'm stuck here with this, having to face another possible amputation. You have to deal with a whole lot of medical issues related to the condition, but you carry with it some stigma associated with, this is, I have brought this on myself. I can't, the other problem that I have is when people describe this as a lifestyle disease. It suggests that people choose to become obese and therefore people choose to become type two, to, to have type two diabetes, which of course is an absolute nonsense. You know, of course people's personalities haven't deteriorated over a 30, 40 year uh, period, but there's no doubt that our physical environment has. So the issue of individual responsibility is a big one because it's pushed very hard by the food industry, it's pushed very hard by governments and people take it on board. People think, gosh, well, if I'm fat, then it's all my fault. Brian's son, Joe, doesn't have type 2 diabetes, but he's worried that his body weight has put him on the same path. Like maybe a year and a half ago, I was like 130 or something like that, and now I'm like 220. So it was like, oh, hell. I don't feel good. It's a lot, it's just a lot harder to do things, just having energy-wise. Um, yeah. Like I've, I'm used to being big. Like, it doesn't worry me too much, but I know in the long run it's going to make a big effect on me. Especially with having, I got young kids, and then I got one on the way. Even just thinking about being able to just play with them is hard. Obesity, for most people, is an entirely normal consequence of having very useful genes in people who are in a very maladaptive society. So I think. Obesity is what we would expect in today's society. I think it is normal. It just happens to have very unfortunate consequences in terms of overall health. Hey, man. How are you? I'm good. Yourself? Buck Stowers Gym is designed for people who live with obesity and type 2 diabetes. Hop on, but don't touch the sides. Two hundred and three point six. I lost a bit, so that's good. How heavy were you before? Two twenty-five. Two twenty-five. Okay. Good work, mate. Let's go upstairs and uh, let me show you around, and let's have a catch up. Sweet, sweet. And this is what we find uh, with our Māori Polynesian people: is that um, they tend to look after everyone else and not themselves. Their own health is not a priority. And we'll find that not only with yourself, but with your parents. It's um, the job to look after your children and the job to look after everyone else around them is bigger than them. If we don't change that philosophy of life, then our children will end up like us. And they can't. Otherwise, they're going to die early. Yeah. Unfortunately, my brother, it has to start with you. Yeah. Someone, there's got to be a leader in the family, and someone's got to lead them out of this. Just got to do it. Yeah. You good with that? Yeah, no, yeah. good. When you join at most gyms, half the people that actually start there and work there, they don't know shit about being fat, they don't know nothing. They just know what they know from a book or what they see on TV. But he's lived it. He's lived through the same sort of thing with his mum, with my dad. To me, the gym is the home of big boys and big girls, and um, there was no gym around that catered for big people. It became a personal goal to be able to, uh, to look after one, one overly sized human being. It's like being encased in a tomb where you can see everything that's going on, but you're dying. When you can't walk properly because you've got gout, you've got diabetes, uh, you're morbidly obese, you're, you're, uh, you're 250 kilos, um, you can't stand up for more than five minutes. 
I've done the whole jump thing before. I got to 200 something kgs already, and then I just got hardcore physical and started eating real healthy, and I lost maybe 80 kgs in like a year and a half. So I know exactly what I've got to do again. It's just the starting point, just getting that motivation of us to hit it hard and go hard and just stay with it. And hopefully it works out. Mm. Just, just hearing that my eldest son is making some steps to improve the quality of life that he's having now, it, it's so awesome. Even, even just sitting here now thinking about it, it's like, well, there's a purpose right there. there there's a reason I should stick around. Just to give my son a hand. And... When you talk to genuine obesity specialists, they say it's nothing to do with willpower. It is nothing to do with eating less and moving more. The, one of them said to me, this is not rocket science. This is much more complicated than rocket science. When you look at this on the individual level, you see that if people follow mainstream guidelines, um, they'll be eating less in a predominantly low-fat uh, kind of philosophy. So they'd be quite hungry and they'd exercise more, which would uh, make them even more hungry. People who've lost weight actually have a greater drive for hunger to put weight on, so they have to consciously work for years after the weight loss to keep it off. Back in the old days, I would train and train and train and eat basically whatever I wanted, which has been wrong. And um, now that I'm older, um, I keep my nutrition very, very clean. Here we have some eggs, which an egg is a whole meal. It's not a partial meal. It's not just protein. It's got essential fats in it. It's got all your, all, all your um, multivitamins and minerals inside an egg. It's a complete meal. Uh, we've got our fibrous carbs, we've got tomatoes, we've got mushrooms, uh, capsicums, and some um, spinach. Having diabetes and high blood pressure it is in my family. And my blood pressure at 51 is a little bit high, and they're keeping an eye on it. I'm very, very mindful that um, I don't want to become a diabetic. Mum took pills every day, every day of her life that I remember. Mum took pills to keep her alive. And she was diabetic and she'd feel dizzy and it would affect her eyesight. She'd be partially blind sometimes and we'd have to shut all the lights down and keep the rooms dark because she, um, she couldn't see and, and um, she'd be in pain. She didn't want to die. She didn't want to die at all. We would pray for a miracle for Mum. So I have a choice now to either be afraid like my mum of dying or fight back and help as many people as I can not to die of the same, the same way that my mum did. That's quite a big breakfast. So what I'll do is I'll probably eat half of this for my breakfast and save the rest of it for my lunch. Every single cell in our body depends on what you put in your mouth. So if you look at it that way, you might think twice before you put some toxic things in your mouth. Some people don't, don't worry and don't really think about that or make the connection, but um, food, is, food is key, really, to everything. And what's happening today is there is a major injustice with food. They're selling crap food to our people. People are becoming, becoming addicted. Well, food has an enormous effect on people's health. Uh, it's, it's one of the dominant causes of cancer, of heart disease, of diabetes, all the big diseases that we're burdened with in this country. And it affects people's health by not only the amount of food that we eat, creating obesity and diabetes, but the type of food that we eat. Um, the type of food has a big effect on things like um, like cholesterol levels, like, like blood glucose levels, like ability to clot and so on. So there's lots of metabolic factors in food 
that have an effect on our, on our system and drive us towards health or disease. We've actually set up society, we've set up the food system to make it very hard for individuals to choose the healthy foods. We're in Mangere Central. Well, this is my home, this is my backyard. This is my people. And you know, and it doesn't take us long just to have a, a quick look around and see the fast food outlets that are in abundance here. The more they insert themselves into our society, the more it becomes normality to us. It is normal for us to shop this way. It is normal for us to go and eat out at foods that deliver no nutritional value for our human bodies. And that's something that we need to address. A lot of my culture have taken on these products um, to be part of their culture. And that's how ingrained it's gotten. We're simply overwhelmed by temptation. It's not that we don't know what we need to be eating. If you go and tap the shoulder of anybody standing on a queue in Burger King or McDonald's and say, do you think this food is healthy? No one's going to say, yes, this, I'm sure this is what we should be eating. Everyone knows what they should be eating. Uh, they're just not eating it. Good on the uh, fast food industry for finding a target. Like that bitch moan about people being overweight and da-da-da-da-da. Oh no, we spend so much money on all these people with diabetics and... But let's go put another fish and chip shop over here. Or we'll put another KFC up over there. So we can't just leave there as a gas station or make it a gas station and a Burger King. So like, yay, more junk food. <laughs> I think that people should be outraged not only against the industry that's making us sick, because, to be honest, we probably buy most of our unhealthy food from the supermarket, so I don't point my finger just at the fast food industry. I'm more inclined to point my finger at government for doing nothing about it. I'm sure you've heard of the Bliss Point, and it is to that formula that the packaged food and the processed food is created to get that best amount of added fat, added sugar, added salt, so this is highly palatable, hyper palatable. And so what do you expect? They've worked out how to exploit our physiology. The more sugar you get, the more sugar you want. Eating too much sugar interferes with your hunger fullness hormones. It interferes with pathways in the brain that makes you want more. And um, when you are constantly eating and tasting sweet, it means that you will constantly seek out that sweet taste. So it does nothing to change that, that sweet palate. It's interesting how uh, difficult it is for some people to give up sugar. Um, we did a, a, a study looking at patients who uh, had type 2 diabetes and asked them how many sugar sweet drinks they had and uh, about a third of people said that they were drinking at least one can of sugary drink per day and this was people who had type 2 diabetes, this included people who were on dialysis people who um, admitted to consuming four sugary drinks a day were about 20% of people. So there is a, a high prevalence of people who, despite our health messages to stop when they have diabetes, are still consuming a lot. I'm the most impulsive buyer out. I'm an impulsive marketeer's dream. You put it near the checkout, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to go, flip, I need that. We're seeing our obesity rate in children uh, skyrocket. We're seeing diabetes in children as well. So, you know, it's it's not a, a specific population group that we need to target here. It's, it's everyone. It's the food supply for everyone. Should there be an age for children to walk into a dairy and buy a V drink? Well, they're not allowed to buy cigarettes, but you're allowed to buy an abundance of sugar to prematurely kill yourself. So should there be some type of governance over how much sugar is sold to children under 16. We have fantastic data from Mexico about the efficacy of a sugar tax. And in actual fact, in Denmark, we had, you know, good data showing the efficacy of a fat tax. The real missing ingredient is the pressure for action. It's not knowing what to do. We know what to do to reduce obesity. Um, governments have signed up to it at, at WHO. Um, it's been agreed with the evidence and with the experts, and it's just not done. They've now put me on lifelong antibiotics, 
and they're hoping that that keeps the infection at bay. Dr. Caldwell doesn't believe it will. He thinks we're fighting a losing battle. But because I've asked them not to take the rest of my leg, this is their best way around that, is to keep me as comfortable as possible. So I'm going to continue to get lots of pain. But when it came right down to it, I'm not going to get any better anyway. Even if they were to do the amputation, I wasn't going to be cured. I've been thinking about how do I want to be remembered. And uh, today I'm going to get a chance to speak to some young people. Brian was a school social worker until he had to give up when his diabetes got worse. The students that I'm meeting today, I haven't seen for two and a half years. So they're all older now, of course. They've moved on to high school. And so, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see where they're at. And I know they're going to get surprised to see what I'm at. A bit moved by um, seeing all the rangatahi here. I feel the love. I feel the love, guys, that it's too much. Um, good to be back in the front area again. Really awesome. No later, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou, kia mai tātou katoa. The honest truth is I'm dying. And I'm dying a lot sooner than I should have. And, um, and, and I'm not going to be around to see my grandchildren attend college. And the sad fact is, you guys are in a massive battle about keeping away from this sort of thing, and you don't even realise it. What I'd like to do is to try to make you think twice before you make that choice. Because it seems to us it's, it's normal, normal to buy these foods that they tell us we can buy. Uh, do you still at the tuck shop? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's in the tuck shop? Pie. Pie. Pork bun. Pork bun. Pork bun. Juicy. All that healthy yeah. stuff. Yeah. Pork buns too and pies. The school needs to make a change. If that's all they're offering, and that's the price they're offering it at, they need to make it easier for you guys to be healthier. You know, they need to do that. But um, even if they offer free fruit on the side. I mean, it's easier said for you to like change your lifestyle or whatever, change whatever you eat, but it's, gonna, it's like hard for us. I don't know, for me, my family eat a lot, and we never really eat really healthy, and we go hard out on the fizzies and everything. Us kids, like, yeah, we have, the, we have the fish and chip shop, but every time we go to the fish and chip shop, we always go past the sushi, a sushi store. We know that sushi is good for us, and all the ingredients there are good for us, but you should see the price, like, the price range is, like, $2.80 for a single sushi, when, you, when, when really you could go to the bakery and get two sausage rolls for $1.50, and that's $3. I don't know, I think it's kind of overwhelming for us now that we're quite aware of, like, BJ's situation and everything, and how he's gotten there. So this is, I don't think anyone's had the time to think about, um, you know, if we could change that lifestyle. I'm gonna make a pledge no longer to give my grandchildren sweets. It's just that simple. You know, I can give them grapes or raisins or something. I just don't have to give them what I haven't given them. And like my sons, Joseph in particular says to me, oh, well, you're, it's your own fault, Dad. And he's right, it's my fault. My fault that I, I got into this position, but in, in actual fact, I've been told recently that it's not that we've been not brainwashed, but we've been sort of taught to believe it's your fault when I really had a choice. I really had no choice. Um, the people that allowed these things to happen, um, they actually controlled what I what I bought and what I ate by making it easier for me to buy. Take me back to the hospital, like that. Well, we need a public uprising, actually. I'd like a civil uprising that people look, look around and think, gee, it's not my fault after all. We should have a better environment and to start demanding it of their workplaces, their schools, their councils, and certainly of the government. I'm sure that people who have lived their lives themselves with the diabetes, with the diabetes that ends up in amputation and heart attacks and blindness and so on, would not wish that on their children. But they're not 
exactly marching in the streets demanding the actions from the food industry and the government um, to create those changes in society so that their children don't get it. They're not marching in the streets. So why is that? I mean, there's no doubt that the key driver must be central government because it's not just about one ministry. It's health, it's education, it's transport, it's, it's sport, it's trade, it's a whole lot of areas that have to come together. And it needs to be taken seriously. Uh, that's what the WHO report says as number one. Governments must take the lead and see it as an urgent and serious problem. I wanted to go to the gym and all that, but I, I know I'll just go home and just start munching like crazy. So I know once I suss out my eating and just cut down pretty much, it'll be a lot more easier to uh, try and make those steps and bettering myself. If I eat a lot more healthier, then I'll get the more energy, then I'll get more motivation to go to the gym, start walking around. It's hard to eat healthy because it's time consuming. You know, it's easy to just fry a steak and some eggs, but to actually stand there and peel the fruit, cut the lettuce, it's just all convenience, just like with life. They'll sell you a big bottle of Coke for $3, but then they'll sell you a little 600 ml for like $4, because it's convenient. So, yeah, eating's all about convenience. Patience, suss that out, you'll be all good. I've often thought a lot about my mortality, more so after I've had these episodes in hospital where I've had to be revived. Just having a family that you love and want to be with does incredible, incredible things for your mind when you're hurting and, and when you're uh, in pain and that distraction of just thinking about the love and the bond that you have between your children and your grandchildren, man, that's, that's been, that's just been so intense for me lately. Attitude was brought to you by New Zealand On Air.